All right, good morning, class. So today, as I was saying, we're going to be learning about inheritance. Object-oriented programming inheritance in Python specifically. So before I get too deep into what inheritance actually is and how we use it, I want to kind of um, give you a disclaimer here up front. I want to tell you really like why this is important, why I am telling you about inheritance, why you should care about it, um, what the bottom line here is. Because in the past, I've given this lecture and just gotten all the way through the bottom. And people have been like, why do I care? How am I going to use this? So I want to just make this really clear up front. I'm going to give you the bottom line up front here. Um, the reason why we use inheritance is because it enables us to write less code. So before I even, even get to the specifics here, just understand like that's the value here. This is what we're trying to achieve. So it may happen sometimes when you are building a program in an object-oriented style, you'll have multiple classes <laughs> And you might notice that there is a lot of redundant code between those classes. So it's possible, not certain, but it is possible that there is an opportunity to use inheritance to reduce the duplicated code between those multiple classes. So in today's lecture, what I want to teach you is how we can identify situations in which inheritance might be useful. And then also learn how to you know, use inheritance. But the most important thing is that successfully using inheritance in your code should make your program smaller. You should end up with just less code. And so if you feel like that's not going to be the case, maybe inheritance is not the tool that you should be using. So that being said, what is inheritance? So inheritance is a relationship between two classes. parent class and a child class. Now you might hear other terms for these. Sometimes instead of parent class, it might be called a super class. And instead of child class, uh, you might hear subclass. So these are synonymous terms. So inheritance helps us model relationships where one class is a subtype of another class. So for example, a dog is an animal. All dogs are animals, but not all animals are dogs. So the important thing here, most critical words in the sentence here is is a. I mean, I know it's an because animal doesn't start with consonant, but is an. This is the critical bit here. Because there are lots of ways that two classes can relate to each other. We could say that, you know, class A has a class B, you know, like a person has a dog, you know, an owner has a pet, for example, but one is not a subtype of another. So that's not what we're talking about. But here, when we're talking about inheritance, we are concerned with an is a relationship where a dog is an animal or for another example, a poodle is a dog. So if you can describe the relationship between these two classes with is a, then this might be a situation that we can model with inheritance. So let's get some code up on the screen. I've talked enough theory for right now. Go back to everyone's favorite dog class. Can we do cats? No, all right. All 
so we're going to make some cats. Got to pass self in. That's always a required parameter. We're also going to have names. Let's say self.name equals name. Great. Dalton, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. So whenever you make a new class, is the only thing that gets ran, like as soon as, so say you said like, I don't know, sign me is equals blah, blah, blah. Is the only thing that will run every single time the init dunder method or will other methods run too? Uh, good question. So if I just instantiate the class, say Garfield equals cat. So at this point on line six, the init method runs, but any other methods that I define for this class will not yet have been done. Sound good? Yep, thank you. Cool. All right, so some other things that cats can do. Uh, I know my cats eat a lot. So let's give them an eat method. Again, always have to pass in self. That's a required parameter for any method, any instance method in an in object-oriented class. We also need to specify what they're eating. All right, great. So just doing a little string interpolation, gonna print out what the cat is eating, just using their name and the food that's passed in. And let's give them a voice. All right, amazing. Great. So we can print, you know, Garfield's name. He's Garfield. We call his eat method, pass in a lasagna, and we see Garfield eats a lasagna. Uses self off of the instance itself, so we didn't have to pass that in. The instance knows who it is, but then we pass in the food for this particular invocation of eat, so that we can see Garfield eats a lasagna, the whole lasagna. Amazing. So this should all look pretty familiar to you based on what we did yesterday. But now let's uh, let's define another class. Now we're coming back to that dog class. So you saw me just copy and paste. So the dog actually has the exact same init method and the exact same eat method as the cat. But instead of a meow method, he's going to get So is there a way to do like a superior class or like simple things where like they're all gonna have a name? Like, could we do like an animal and then have like cats and dogs under that for their particular methods? Yes. Or would you always do it separate like this? Um, that's a really great question. I think you might be getting ahead of us by just a minute. Okay. Well, if I go. All right, so spot eats kibble, got a very similar method. So let's look at the work that I've done here. Um, maybe we'll zoom out a little bit. So this cat class and this dog class, this dog class should look pretty similar, right? So why are these classes so similar?
Because they're both. Uh, they both give a name, and they both eat. Yeah. So there are certain methods that were copied between them, but let's think more like abstractly, more generally. You know, even like kind of outside of a programming context, why would a cat class and a dog class be similar? Or both because animals. Both animals. Yeah. So a cat and a dog are both um, types, both subtypes of some third thing. They're both animals. You can say a cat is an animal, a dog is an animal. So in that case, this might be an opportunity uh, for us to use inheritance. Now, I want to point out here that in this case in particular, like it's not just enough to see that they have duplicated code, but I want to make sure that there's actually like an inherent relationship between these two things. Like, this is like a permanent real world relationship between dogs, cats, and animals that isn't likely to change in the near future if like the boss comes in and says the requirements are different now. So like to kind of give you another example, let's say I was uh, writing a program that had dogs in it and then also has tables in it. So dogs and tables both have four legs. So it might seem like I could create a common parent class for both of them, four-legged, that both dogs and tables inherit from. But the thing is that a dog and a table are not really like inherently like subtypes of the same thing. That's just kind of a coincidence based on, you know, the state of my program currently that dogs and tables both have four legs. But it's very likely that as I continue developing that program, there will be more and more differences between dogs and tables and it'll make less and less sense to inherit them. So you shouldn't like just immediately notice like, oh, hey, there's one function that's copied between two classes. I should use inheritance. Like slow down a little bit, try to think forward a little bit and ask if this really makes sense, if these are really subtypes of some common thing, or if it's just a coincidence that they have, you know, a method with the same name or they have a property with the same name. Hmm. So in this case, it's a good use case for inheritance, but I just want to caution you against, you know, using inheritance prematurely. Um, I think that like for a lot of developers after they learn inheritance, it's the hammer that makes all their problems look like nails. And so they try to apply it to as many situations as they can. And in general, I think Inheritance is probably not the best way to solve random problems that you come across. So I just don't think it should be your first choice tool when you're solving new problems. You're not really sure how to approach them. But for this specific example, definitely a great choice. So we need to make a new class called animal that is going to kind of share the common things that cats and dogs can both do by virtue of being animals. So create a class animal. Okay, so we've got our animal class kind of defining generic functionality that applies to any animal, regardless of its species. So now we can remove that redundant code from our other classes. So the init method, it's the same in both of them. You don't need to say it twice. Uh, the eat method is the same in both of these classes. So I'm gonna remove that. Now we've got these two methods here, meow and bark. They look like they're kind of similar to speak. So I'm gonna refactor this a little bit. I'm gonna call these methods the same name. So um, now, wait, hold on, one other thing I forgot. The actual inheritance part of it.
So there's an extra bit of syntax here that we need to learn. When you're defining a class, normally we don't have parentheses after it for just a single class. But when you are inheriting, we can add parentheses and then put the parent class in parentheses. So you could read this as the cat class inherits from animal. And similarly, the dog class inherits from animal. Um, questions? Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask you, so at what point do you think it would be safe for us to go ahead and do the inherit inheritance when you're typing your code? So it would be safer just to go ahead and type out your code and then at the end, come back and check and see what things are related so it's not redundant? Right. I would generally think about inheritance when I'm refactoring my code, but not when I'm writing it in the first place. So for you know first version of a project, I would probably just have a cat class and a dog class. And if it occurred to me at some point that there's a lot of redundant code between them, and there's probably going to become more redundant code as the project continues, I would pause for a moment and refactor my code to use a base animal class to avoid um, you know, repeating code. But I would wait until it's obvious that I'm repeating code and it's obvious that inheritance will save me effort. Uh, what other question do we have? I was gonna ask, uh, I guess originally before we came into this, I was imagining that a parent class would have, you know, you'd have class and then you'd indent your, uh, your modules. And then within that indention, you'd create another class, uh, which sounds horrible now that I think about it, but would you, I mean, it seems like this, you, I, I'm guessing that I would never find myself having to put a class inside of a class because I can just put them side by side and then parent one to the other, right? So apparently that is actually yeah. a thing in Python. You can have subclasses, a class that's defined inside of a class, um, like that kind of. Mm. I'm not really sure why you would do that. We're going to see some frameworks later that might do that for some weird reasons, or they'll ask you to do that to do something specific. But it's not something I would think to do normally. But they're the same, right? Behavior uh, I'm sorry, I don't really know what like a nested class would be similar to. This okay. is different than inheritance. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Okay, never mind then. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Angel? Can you have more than one parent class? Uh, yes, that comes later in today's lecture. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have our animal, our cats, we got dogs. So let's just run through this again, make sure the code still works the same way. Okay, cool. So we can see now that, um, uh, which we call it. So our code still behaves exactly the same way. We can get Garfield's name and we can make him eat a lasagna, even though in the cat class, it doesn't have an init method and it doesn't have an eat method. So when I try to call a method on a subclass, if that method doesn't exist on that subclass, Python will look to its parent class and see if the method exists there. So on line 19, I try to initialize a new cat, but the cat class doesn't have an init method. So that's fine. We're just gonna use the init method that's defined on the animal. Similarly, I try to call the eat method on Garfield. Um, the cat class doesn't have an eat method. 
So we're going to use the one on the animal class. Uh, similarly, we can make him speak. And now uh, the animal class does have a method called speak, but since there's also a method with the same name defined on the child class, this is considered like more specific, I guess. So because it exists in both places, but I tried to call the method off of Garfield a cat, it's gonna use the cat version of speak. And since it exists, it never checks for the animal version of speak. So I have overridden a parent's method using a child's method. Questions? Angel? I left my hand up. Sorry. Caleb? Um, yeah, just something that's probably pretty basic. Um, you referenced subclasses and child class. Is there one that's technically correct and one that's not technically correct, or are you just using them both synonymously? Um, I tend to use them synonymously. I probably don't even notice as I'm switching between them while I'm talking. Uh, maybe if we're in Python, subclass and superclass is a little bit more appropriate because there is actually a super uh, built-in function in Python, which is, we're gonna see that soon related to object-oriented programming. So I'm guessing super and sub are maybe more Pythonic terminology. Okay, um, a follow-up question. I know, um... Justin mentioned like having a class that's indented inside of another class. Does that change the terminology there too, or is that just another kind of subclass? It's not a subclass. It's like having a class like that inside of a class. It's not a subclass. It's some weird like Python specific nested class thing. I don't really know why you would do this. Um, Inner class. I guess nested class is another good way to look at it as well. Uh, yeah, so you're of a class color, and then there's, get out of here. You can define this class light green inside of it. I have no idea what this accomplishes. Um, this isn't a thing that you do in other programming languages, really. Uh, okay, why inner class? Hopefully, this explains things. Um, oh yeah, that's that's weird. I guess this is not how I would organize this. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't worry about it too much. This is kind of like a Python specific version of OOP. Um, OOP in other languages, you're not going to be making nested classes like that. I don't think. I've nice. never seen a nested class. I just want to throw that out there to, to reinforce what you're saying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there, there could be great use cases for it, but it, it looks like the road to nightmare to me. <laughs> for sure. Okay, so let's see, what do we got here? Okay, so, so far what we're looking at is uh, we've got a couple of methods where the subclasses use the exact same version of that method as the parent class. So we just omitted it from the child class. So like the dog and class don't have eat or init methods. And we've also got an example where the child class uses an entirely different method than the parent class. So like speak is completely unrelated 
to uh, the cat speak completely unrelated to the animal speak. So we just made a new method with the same name. Um, but a more interesting situation is when we want to define a method in the child class that uses some of the functionality of the parent class, not exactly the same functionality, but some of it, and then extends it a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, let's think about one way that we can take this a step further. I'm thinking about one difference between dogs and cats is that dogs can potentially be service animals. You know, you slap a vest on them and you can take them into all kinds of places where you're not normally allowed to have pets, but you can't do that with a cat. Um, if you, you know, try to put a fancy looking vest on a cat, you still can't like take it into a movie theater or on an airplane or wherever. Um, so I'm gonna extend the dog class so that it has an extra parameter that potentially our dogs can be service animals. Um, so in our dog class, now I'm gonna actually need to define an init method because it's gonna be a little bit different from the generic animal functionality. Okay, so we're gonna do some kind of tricky stuff here. So I need to, I need to access the, um, the init method from the animal class because I want to perform this logic, this self.name equals name. I want to perform this logic without duplicating this code. And then I want to do more work after it. So uh, since I've defined my own init method here, when I instanti instantiate a dog, it's going to run this init method instead of the animal init method, but I can still manually call this animal init method. So the way I do that is first, I have to access an instance of the parent class. So this is the Python specific syntax for that. I call the super method inside of my class, and this returns an instance of the parent class. So this parent instance is going to have all of the same methods like eat, speak, and relevant in this situation, dunder init. All right, so this gives me an instance of the animal class. And note, I don't even have to pass any arguments in here. So it's like a super generic version of the animal class that doesn't even have data, but at least it's got the methods. Uh, Dennis? Does it matter where that super goes? Because when I typed in def init in mine, that super, it like auto-populated uh, next to self. I'm not sure if I follow you. Um, I can show my screen real quick. Uh, sure. When I see if I could if I could do it again. So when I so when I typed in def, oops, and it it popped up really like that. Is that is that kind of the same thing? Or is that just something different? I'm, I'm like um. What that is, is the very next step that I'm going to show you combined with the step that I just showed you. So that is exactly what I'm about to do, just in a slightly more concise way. Okay. Um, that's neat that your editor does that. I, I don't think I've seen that before. All right, so I've got the parent instance that's returned by super. And now this parent instance has the init method on it. So I can call parent instance dot init. 
and then we will pass in the name. Now, I know I told you before that you're never going to call this dunder init method manually, and so that was not true. I proved myself a liar in about a day's time, but this is the only instance where you're going to do that. And normally this is kind of a strange thing to do, but because we're kind of like deep in the inner workings of our class, kind of setting up these relationships, we're going to manually uh, repurpose this init method. But basically what this is saying is, um, sorry, so we are reusing the parents init method and giving it the dog's name. And so it's going to do all this work here of assigning that name to self. So I just want to re, I want to repeat all the work that's in the animals init method without actually copy pasting this code. So this is how we do that. I know it might look a little weird here because this is two lines of code in order to avoid duplicating one line of code, but you've got to imagine in a larger application, this init method might be, you know, dozens of lines of code doing some more interesting stuff. Justin? If you're going to invoke the init of the parent uh, class, <clears throat> do you have to be careful not to have, what's the word? Uh, I guess count uh, 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 self variables that are conflicting. You know what I mean? So if you had, uh, if you had a uh, uh, pair, uh, well, let's see, dog instance, I guess, dog.name being defined here, you couldn't invoke the parent instance in it because it's also doing a animal.name. You know what I mean? Is that going to be a problem? Um, no, I don't think so. There's only one self involved in this. So when we call mm. spot equals dog, there's one blank object that is created for self. And so that same object can get sent through um, the parents init method as part of the dog's init method, but there's still just one object for self. Okay, it's maybe so not self obvious just looking at the syntax, but that's what goes on. So, pardon? Okay. So the self is shared uh, among the uh, the subclass that it's assigned to, or I guess the, the yeah subclass, and its parent class, uh, and it's just. I get it. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I would just say that for one instantiation of an object, there's only one self created, even if you know there are multiple subclasses in use. Okay. Um, we had a bunch of other hands up. Yeah, so I'll try to word this concisely, but bear with me if I meander a bit. Um, so that parent line 30, you mentioned that that's going to create an instance of the animal class. Um, and then I think you also mentioned that that basically drags in the eat function from the parent as well. Um, so my question, one of my questions is, let's say, um, let's say we wanted to add on to that eat function, right? Where instead of just saying print the cat eat or the dog eats the bone, we also want to say, we also want to print something else. Would we then have to add that line 30 below um, our eat function as well? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, and that's actually something we're going to get to later on in this lecture. Okay. Um, and then I kind of find it odd that we need to put those lines at all. Um, since I would think that inheritance, you automatically are inheriting those things anyways. So, but is that just basically any time you're going to update or add additional, you have to put both of those lines? Right. 
So if I want to just use the init method from the animal class without any modification, then I could just not define this right. and it would use the animals one. So it's this situation is a little bit trickier because I want to use some yeah. of the behavior from the animal class and then do more. Right. Um, okay, so I guess you'll answer that first question I had later. Um, but let's say that the um, parent had five parameters that were being passed in with the init method. I imagine on line 29, you would also have to put all of them there as well, but then you would only need lines 30 and 31 and wouldn't have to copy all of the extra things. Yeah, that's right. So the animal class requires one parameter name. Um, the dog class, because it's an animal, also requires name, but dog specifically. I would have never guessed I'd be friends with Commander. Require the is service <laughs> animal uh, argument. <laughs> so is service animal is only relevant to dogs, whereas name is relevant to all animals. So when I'm reusing the animal init method, I'm only passing in the arguments that animal needs. So that's just name right here. But then elsewhere in this um, dog init method, I can use the dog specific parameters. So for example, I guess I feel like it would be more efficient if you didn't even have to put lines 30 and 31 since it already belongs to the parent and all you would have to do is add in line 33 and it would already inherit all of the init from the parent plus the additional line 33. But I guess that's not the case. Right. I mean, if I don't have these lines here, the assumption is that this init method is entirely replacing Okay. The animal in it method. Got it. Okay. Good to know. Were there other hands up? So just to be clear on that, so if you so if the animal init method had, I don't know, two more parameters that you need to pass in that the dog also needs, are you going to have to write an additional line 31 for each of them? So if you had, I don't know, I don't know. So essentially you just put parents instance dot init and then parameter one and two, is that how that would work? Um, so let's see, let's say in addition to name, we had color. Um, so Garfield, orange. Brown. So then dog also needs to have a color parameter because animals have color. And then we pass it into the constructor. So all of the arguments that the parent cares about, so again, animal class needs name and color, doesn't know about is service animal. Those arguments get passed right back into the parents init method. Then the ones that are specific to the dog do not because animal doesn't know what to do with this is service animal um, argument. Danielle? Yeah, one question about the use case of this. Can you use it to modify other classes? For example, I was thinking of modify how a dictionary is sorted in by inheriting that class, like making a subclass of that, that sorts differently or something? Um, you could make a subclass of the dictionary class. I've never thought to do that, but yeah, if you just don't exactly like how Python dictionaries work and you think that they should work slightly differently, you could totally make a subclass of the Python dict type, the dict class. 
Oh, that's cool. Yeah, not exactly sure what that. Yeah, because is. I was thinking that yesterday, think about the sorting. Like instead of doing that, just make a second, like dictionary builder that sorts for, I don't know, the names or something like that. Instead of creating a dictionary and then sort it. Maybe. I'm not sure what would be best. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please ask your question, but unmute yourself first, if you could. Uh, so I had a question about, um, so you said that for the parent of the super thing, you can do, you can copy some of the init method from the parent class. So could you pick and choose, like, let's say the init method from the parent class had color, but for your dog, you really didn't care about the color. You just wanted the name. Could you? cherry pick which um, instance variables you take from the parent class or do you just, is it all of them? Just all, I can't pick and choose. I can okay. either, you know, replace the init method entirely or use the original init method without modifications or use the entire init method and then do some of my own stuff afterwards. So I couldn't call this function but only assign name without assigning color. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, what other questions do we have? So you're basically taking the init method from the, from the animal class, and then you're adding your own parameter with that, that block of code that you have down there. Is that essentially yeah. what's going on? Yeah, cool. that is what's going on. So let's actually take a quick look here, print. Oh, yeah. Um, so spot is a service animal. Cool. So here I've been able to make a dog. Uh, he can eat. We can see all of his information. And lastly, spot.isServiceAnimal is true. So I was able to use the init method from the parent to redo the constructor function. So that assigned the name and color to our dog. So I didn't have to repeat that logic here. Um, and also the specifics for the dogs, the information that is unique to dogs that not all animals have is service animal. This was also applied to our dog. So we can see that it has a value of true here. Um, so let's actually use that in some of our other methods. Uh, Caleb, you have a question? Yeah, just um, on line 32, when you're calling the uh, the parent in, in it, if you accidentally leave out, say, name or color, will it throw errors or will it, what will it do? Okay. Thanks. Yep. So yeah, this function is defined as taking three arguments, self, name, and color. And then when I call it, you know, self goes in automatically. Don't, don't ask too many questions. Don't think too hard about it. Self goes in automatically. Then I still have to pass in name and color. So yeah, color is missing. There's a mismatch number of arguments and Python's gonna yell at me about that. What if you were to like call dog without the color uh, variable when you set it equal to spot? Uh, similar kind of story. Missing a required parameter. So like if you did that and the init, when you call the init, if that was missing color also, is it still gonna throw errors? If this is missing, you're saying? Yeah, that and then the parent instance one. Like if those are all missing, is it gonna throw errors? Yeah, because this parent init method, like this function I'm calling right here, init, is this function defined up here. It okay. needs name and color. 
And so I'm still not giving it what it needs here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is that, another is that even if you set it as a constant? Sorry, there are a few voices at once. I was saying, is that even if you set it as a constant? I know yesterday you had shown an example of like when you do your init, if you were to like set that value already equal to something, you're still required to put it in for the subclass. Um, yeah. Are you saying if I defined a default value? Like, right. Like everything's brown unless you make it blue in the, the local, in the subclass. So that works. So we're no longer missing a parameter because if it is not explicitly passed in, Python is prepared to use a default value. Okay. Great questions though. Um, and again, uh, please ask questions. This is another one of those lectures that could be over very quickly if people are not asking questions, but this is also um, pretty fundamental material. Definitely kind of hard to wrap your mind around at first. And this is absolutely something that you will be asked questions about in interviews. So like, please stop me as much as you feel is useful, ask questions. Uh, speaking of questions, someone just raised their hand. So, so you just wrote parent instance equals super so that we can see what it's doing. But in reality, you can just do super dot init and, and then the parameters. Uh, yeah. So this is exactly the same as okay. the above lines, just condensed into one line. Um, so most commonly, you'll actually see it like this, how it is on line 33. But I just wanted to be a little bit more clear about what we were doing. You know, I'm calling this method. It returns an object. That object has the init method on it. So it's you know exactly the same as what I'm doing here. I just wanted to break it apart, make it a little bit easier for us to read as we're seeing this for the first time. Do we have more questions right now? Question, question, questions. Um, there was a question in the chat earlier actually about organization. If um, Python best practices to put each class in their own file and, and I found a, a link that I threw in the resources channel, but Raphael, if you have, I think it'd be helpful because I'm not as familiar with Python and what your perspective and experiences on that and, and organizing and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, again, I'm also not like a, a lifelong Python developer. Most of my professional work has been in JavaScript, but I mm -hmm. think the convention here is still pretty similar across many object-oriented languages. Um, you're generally going to be defining a class in their own file. Not that you necessarily need to do that, but practically speaking, an individual class is going to be big enough. It's going to be complex enough that like once you write a class in a file, that file is going to be big. It's going to be full. You know, you're not going to want to put anything else in there. And, and like conceptually, like nothing else is related to that class. Like you should ideally put like related things together in the same file. And it kind of makes sense that a single class can stand by itself in its own file. Um, then you would just import it into other files, into other parts of your program as needed. So maybe, what are your thoughts about, uh, oh, sorry, someone was. Uh, I was just gonna say, it might be if you have like a whole bunch of really small classes that do kind of similar things, like maybe you would put multiple classes in one file. I could potentially see that situation coming up, but generally I would expect that each class would have its own file. That's what I was gonna ask about. I was gonna ask about like with this example, if, if it would make sense to leave it all in one file or not. Yeah, I think it would just, you know, given how small these classes are, it would, you know, be just extra overhead to put them all in their own files and be importing things into my one like main file. Um, but also just because I'm 
trying to teach you all inheritance for the first time, I wanted to make it as easy to read as possible. So I wanted us to be able to just read one file from top to bottom and understand the flow of the code. Even though in a more practical project, I would be organizing things into different files. I think it just makes it harder for us to follow as students as I'm just, you know, like bouncing back and forth between different files constantly. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, that, that totally makes sense. Angel, what's on your mind? At the end of this, um, at the end of this like lecture, once we get through all the inheritance and o OOP stuff, can you give us, give us an example of that importing, like a uh, class file to a like your main file? Uh, yeah, that would be good to demonstrate. Can totally do that. Um, yeah. So, do we have any other questions for right now? I think there's one in the chat from Alicia. What's on your mind, Alicia? Um, so similar to what Maya said with the default value, how you know you wouldn't have to include it because it inherits that from the parent. Could you change the default parameter in line uh, 30? So instead of color equals brown, basically just say color equals blue. And therefore you want the default value specifically for the dog class to be blue and not brown. Uh-huh. And you wouldn't have to add any other syntax. Um, oh, so there is a problem though, that in Python positional arguments have to go before keyword arguments. So like this kind of thing generally does work. It just doesn't like that this is a positional argument after this keyword argument. So can I just say, um, that's that's tricky. Hmm. As, as someone relatively new to Python. So yeah, I'd have to rearrange the arguments, I think. Um, but that gets weird because the dog has is service animal and the animal does not. So I can't like put this dog specific argument before the generic like animal parameter. Um, so I wanna say what you're asking is definitely possible, but it's kind of escaping me at the moment how like specifically to phrase my code to make it work that way. I might have to tinker with it and refactor a little bit. Okay. Can you do it on the, uh... The parent instance and it method instead on line 33, I think. 32. When you're calling in those additional parameters. Um, I mean, just what are you asking? The the same thing she was like to change like the default dog class when it initializes. Can you put the color oh. equals blue there instead of brown from the parent class? Like will it override it in that line? Uh yeah, so since color is a keyword argument here, I can just say color equals red. Um, so yeah, this is interesting now. So so for our cats, the color is actually parameterized. You should be able to pass in any color. But for our dogs, all of our dogs are going to be red. Does this work how I think it does? Yeah, okay, so Spot, he's red, he is a service animal. This is definitely starting to make my brain hurt a little bit, just with like the arguments being passed through multiple times and like being optional and having yeah. different defaults at different levels. And the dog can only be red now, which sort of defeats the purpose of um, what we were trying to accomplish. So you I'm, couldn't I'm, pass in blue. Uh, right, that'll do nothing. Cause yeah, the dog class at this point, they just take two arguments name and is service animal. Uh, we're not even prepared to receive a color. So when we call the parents init method, we're just hard coding in this color. All the dogs are red. 
But couldn't you reassign the color in the driver code? I mean, like after I create the animal, I can say spot.color equals whatever I want. But there's no way to do that in the construction of our dog based on how our classes are set up currently. Well, isn't so I'm just kind of confused. I don't know if it's because it's kind of getting into the weeds, but isn't typing what you type in line 32, wouldn't that be the same thing as typing color equals red in spot 43, except now you could actually change it to whatever you wanted depending on the object? So you mean like this? Uh, I mean, I, well, I, th I mean, wouldn't you have to now go into line 30, I guess, and change color back? I mean, I don't know. I, feel, I guess I think it's just getting so like weird that I don't even, but I guess my whole point is uh, why would you ever put color equals red? Why would you ever do that when you could just do it in line 43 and said, like, wouldn't that just be the simpler, smarter answer? Well, it's nice to have default values for certain things. So color equals red doesn't make sense for this example, but like is service animal false would definitely be like a good default value to have. Well, but so let's be clear here. Um, saying color equals red when I'm calling the super init method this isn't really like a default value. This is a mandatory value. At this point, there's no way that I can instantiate a dog as any color other than red. Yeah, that was what I was thinking. So that's why really? I was asking. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just hard coded right in, right in here. The dog init method, the dog constructor doesn't actually take in color. So it's, there's nowhere I can pass it in when I call dog. Oh, in that case, yeah, that's true. I, in this circumstance, it becomes a mandatory. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. So does this still work? Blue dog. Cool. So one more thing that I just wanted to show you here real quick. Was, yeah, so in speak, let's actually use some of our dog specific parameters here. All right, so now our dogs are actually using this uh, is service animal variable that we passed in. So let's just see spot uh, speak. So because he is a service animal, that's his special type of dog. We're able to use that in the speak method. Um, because again, the dog has their own unique speak method that is different from uh, the animal speak method. So it's able to use some of our dog specific functionality. Um, okay, so I think we're overdue for a break at this point. Does anyone have any more questions before we pause? For the moment yeah i just had a real quick one um just like how we 
um, borrowed the parent init um, to add extra stuff to it. If the parent had a different function, so like, you know, speak, and we wanted to use like the basic speak, but add more, we, we could do the same thing as we did on lines 31 and 32. Yeah. So, everything. So, like, if we wanted to use everything underneath the animal speak plus more, would we initialize it or just completely rewrite it still? So let's see. Speak. Um, Can you use parent instance there, Raphael? I'm not actually sure. We're going to find out. Cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, actually, let's just see what happens. Going to remove some of these other prints. Just creating spot. And then he's going to speak. OK. Um, OK, so this is almost kind of sensible. <clears throat> so we're saying that we want uh, we want our dog speak method to not be completely unrelated to the animal speak method, but we want to extend it. So we're going to use uh, the animal speak functionality and then do additional things afterwards. So first I just call super, which gives us an instance of the animal class, and then I call it speak method. And so just as a refresher, all that does is print I am an animal. And so, in fact, we do see that at the command line here. I am an animal. And then it continues on to do the dog specific speaking. But more specifically, my name is Spot and I'm here to help. Um, we could probably make this a little bit more interesting and more practical. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thought I had to sneeze, maybe not. Um, so instead of just printing, this data, we should probably be returning it. That's usually more useful in a practical kind of situation. So we're going to return. All right, so now, um, this super speak is not actually printing anything. It's just going to return the actual text it's going to say. So let's say, so I'm going to assign that to a variable, parent speech equals super dot speak. We can print. Parent speech dot upper. Cool. So now we're utilizing the parents speak method, but we're not doing it exactly the way that the parent would do it. First, we're just calling it to access what that return value would be. And then in the dog speak method, we can modify that however we want. We can um you know, apply any arbitrary logic to it to make it fit in our program. So I'm saying in this case, um, you know, dogs are maybe bigger than lots of other animals. They're bigger than cats, for example. So I guess they're a little bit louder. So he's going to tell you he's an animal in all caps. So after uh, getting the parent speech, I'm just calling super.speak, I can modify that by calling upper on it. It just capitalizes the string. And then we print that. So now, the 
dog class is able to utilize the parent's speak method, but with a slight twist on it, because he capitalizes it, and then he does his own dog specific stuff afterwards. I just saw a hand up. Did you, so did you, did I miss it? Did you change the parent speak to not print automatically? Like shouldn't it print on line 40 as well? I did change that. Okay, I must have not seen it. Cool. Yeah, so in order to make this last example work, I had to change this so it's no longer printing. Uh, it is returning that data. Cause yeah, if it was just printing, it would just go right to the console just as it was here in lowercase, but because it's returned, uh, now this other part of the code has the opportunity to operate on it. Cool. Thank you. Yep. All right. What other questions do we have right now? Any other I, I have a can question. You scroll back up to the return statement again, so mm -hmm. I can type that. There we go. I have a question, but it might be better suited till after the break that you wanted to have. Uh, why don't you ask it and I'll decide. Okay. Um, so if if the class animal has a function, right? So it has speak, uh, and that belongs, or that can be, uh, uh, well, it belongs to both cats and dogs. They can both they can both speak, right? Mm -hmm. I'm an animal. Um, If you had a a method at the parent class that was that is utilized by both subclasses, but you wanted to impose some uh, addition or limitation to one of the subclasses on how they use that method, would you end up kind of creating that wrapper function? scenario or would you do just define them differently in the subclasses is that too convoluted of a question <laughs> um so they can no it's say, not too convoluted okay. i'm just trying to think about how it would code out an example of that um so yeah that is a good question might take me a minute to think about so why don't we take a break and then yeah. <laughs> after the break i'll uh code up a demo for that so it's 10, 17 right now. Let's take a break, a little over 10 minutes. Come back at 10.30, and we're going to continue talking about inheritance. Uh, sorry about that. Get out of here. Um, Okay, so where we left off previously, uh, Justin, you were asking a really great question. Yeah, I have a better way of framing it. Okay, let's hear it. Um, so you don't have this method, but let's say you had a method that was uh, under the class animal and it was uh, eat food daily, right? Um, both animals eat, so they just utilize that method that belongs in the animal class. But if dogs were allowed to eat twice a day and cats were allowed to eat four times a day, how would you, within their individual classes, limit their access to that uh, parent module? Mm -hmm. Would you use a wrapper function within their individual classes or would you just rewrite the function and add a counter or something? I mean, in that specific case, I might. I might just add a parameter here to animal, just like daily meals. Yeah. Um, and so then just as you're creating, well, hmm, I, don't know, I don't know if I like that actually. Um, yeah, actually, that could be fine. So animal. Takes daily meals. Why is this red?
Is it because oh, right. a keyword? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the problem again. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna make this a positional argument. This is this is giving me trouble here. Uh, So then in so my name color daily meals in the dog okay so here uh, cat doesn't have their own init method it's just going to use the default animal one Uh, so daily meals is just going to be one if we don't pass that in for the cat. Uh, whereas the dog, you know, we're overriding the animal constructor and here it hard codes in daily meals equals two. So all dogs get to eat two meals a day. Uh, so that's probably how I would approach that in this situation. So going off that same example, let's say all dogs have meals of two, but then you have like a really skinny dog. He eats, needs to eat more than all the other dogs. Could you just for tiny override his just by saying like tiny dot daily meals equals three? Um, tiny being the dog's name, obviously. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're going to do that after the fact we could do that so dog equals tiny he is teal or not uh probably rolling around in something he shouldn't have been and now he's teal uh he's not a service animal so but there's no method involved here. So if there was a method in animal that said, uh, you know, define, uh, eat a meal. Uh, yeah, we would need to it, define a method that uses this also. And it tracked it, okay. Um, yeah, kind of using our imagination here that in the eat mm -hmm. method, you know, we could just check like, um, we have to actually count how many times we've eaten and then check that against daily meals. Uh, so I guess we would need What if you just count backwards? All right, so if you're if you're defining their meal limit uh, upper limit, if your okay. function an animal just said uh, every time you called it and and you had that animal eat, it would subtract their self dot daily meals by one. Yeah, that's as another way we could do it. Not equal to zero, or less than zero. Okay. So yeah, this before is like- you, Before you okay. do change over to that way though, do you mind finishing out this example so I can see if it's possible this way? Um, or did we just find out it's not possible? So I'm just getting twisted up here. What is- what are we going for right now? What is our current example we're working towards? So you were passing in daily animal, daily meals, but then you're saying that dogs, you're hard coding in line 32, that they only get two. Mm -hmm. Now I was asking, well, what if you have a specific dog that needs three? Okay. Um... So, I mean, we could just, so you might have to do a little debugging, I don't know. So, I mean, we could just say tiny dot, Do we, what's, 
sorry, I'm just catching up. Um, is Daily Meals in the, the constructor for dog right now? Uh, it's not anywhere. I think it should be somewhere. Uh, yeah. Could we do a keyword arg uh, argument in the dog constructor for Daily Meals? Let's try that. So I'll put that there, Daily Meals. Uh, equals two. Or we'll give that a keyword as well. Uh, service animal is false. Oh, nice. So we can return. Is it wrong? You have Garfield initialized, but we didn't pass in a daily meals for him. All right. Is that where is that guy at? Or true false, yeah. Okay. In the middle. Yeah. Is that the bottom right now? 22. 22. 22. I would have. Yeah, but wouldn't that just default to one since you put equals one? It should. I'm not sure why it's missing. That's what I would have thought too. Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, nice. And in that. And then let's get there are some of these other printing statements. Cool. So, so tiny dot daily meals is two. Um, if I want, I can just assign to it. If you know this guy is extra hungry, and I think you set it up in the constructor where we could like mm -hmm. make a, a, another dog, and and set daily meals um, when we instantiate it. Yep. That's the word. So if we know at the time he's instantiated that he should have three daily meals, then yeah, there's a better way that we could organize our classes here to um, allow that in the constructor. So let's see, tiny teal. This, uh -huh. Yeah, anyways. Um, so it's already got daily meals as the third parameter. Why not? It kind of tripped me up a little bit how I was not passing in daily meals, but I was passing in is service animal. And Python just kind of understood that this true value or the false value I had for tiny was referring to his service animal and not daily meals. But I think it's doing some kind of sanity checking with the types. And it knows that like his service animal should be Boolean, daily meals should be a number. Um, not exactly sure, but I think Python is being a little bit smarter than me in this case. Anyways, uh, so daily meals is five. Sort of the same rule is true. Let's take that out. Um, no, it did not work. What am I missing here? Dalton? 
So isn't it isn't it the same concept you did earlier? Isn't it because you're setting daily meals to two? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Okay. Well, if you pass just five instead of daily meals equals five, wouldn't it rewrite that? Um, that should be the same. When you initiate tiny. The I problem when you is said here on line thirty three. I'm hard coding in daily meals equals two. I, I I thought when you did that as an argument into a function it was seen as an optional input on the user input side. So if the user doesn't put anything in that field, it will default to daily meals equals two. So but if they careful. do put something there, it'll overwrite it. Uh, be careful because this is not a function definition. It's not an argument. Okay. This is actually gotcha. a function call. I understand. So we are, we are calling this function here ourselves and this is what I'm passing in. Uh, so here I'm going to use the daily meals argument that gets passed into the dog constructor, which if nothing's passed in, that's going to be two. But if something is passed in, we should be able to pass it through. Cool. So that actually worked how I wanted to this time. Can you, could you just scroll back up to the animal so I can see the... Mm -hmm. And again, just for reference, all this code is going to be up on GitHub this afternoon, so you can review it at your leisure. So right now, daily meals is defaulting to one for the animal, but defaults to two for the dog. Correct. And then you have to set daily meals to daily meals because you're passing in an argument, so it'll override the default. Right. So if the dog is instantiated without daily meals being specified, then the dog constructor is going to default that to two. But then when we call the parent constructor, like that two is going to get passed in, that default from the dog constructor is going to get passed in there. And so then for the animal constructor, that's going to override our default here. So it's going to use two for the daily meals in the animal constructor instead of one because the dog kind of has its own default value that overrides the animal default value. And then you override it manually by putting in five. Mm -hmm. So my, my original question hasn't quite been answered. Uh, so we set upper limits for how many meals each dog, uh, well, the dogs and the cats are allowed to eat, but if the, if uh, you know, if, if I own a, a a a shelter, and I just fed Tiny, I want to say Tiny dot has been fed, and it would run a parent function under animal, that counts. Uh, he's been fed, right? But I want I want that parent method, that parent function uh, has been fed because it's shared among all the classes but with different upper limits within each class, right? So it limits, it limits each class's ability to access that parent method. See what I mean? Um, I'm not sure. So like for this example, if I wanted to limit uh, how much each animal could eat, we can just decrement daily meals. And as long as it's greater than zero, they can continue to eat. So they don't actually need a different eat method, I don't think, as long as the daily meals parameter is different. What if you didn't have an upper limit? You can't decrement from infinity. I mean, okay, we're not gonna get into the philosophy of infinity minus one, but... <laughs> So you just want to like count how many times they've eaten in the day or? Yeah, from, from like bottom up. I don't know. So you and have instead a, of it, daily meals, we could just have like meals yeah. eaten and start at zero and increment it. Yeah. All right, so it looks like the answer generally is just to add a, uh, a variable in that you can check the, uh, the method usage against. Um, that's, that's one way, um, or just, you know, overriding the method so that cats and dogs have different versions of eat 
that just do slightly different things. Mm. Um, you know, maybe this eat method should be returning its value. And so then the cat and dog eat methods can first call the animal eat and then access that return value and then modify it in their cat specific or dog specific ways. So that'd be kind of similar to, um, you know, what we got over here. Does that sound good? Yeah. Cool. Uh, what other what other questions have we got? Yeah, I do have a question because this has uh, been bothering me for a while. I can't seem to find it in Google either. Is there a way to, when you create an instance, is there a way to skip over attributes if you don't know them? So say if you have a dog class with you know, name, breed, uh, sound, and color, if you only know that dog's name and color, can you skip over the, like you already set a default argument, but can you just skip over the, uh, the breed and sound if you don't know them? If they don't have default arguments, then you cannot skip over them. But uh, but if they do have default arguments, it, mm -hmm. it seems like I still can't skip over them. And if you do use none, it just comes up as none. So it would be dog name, none, none, instead of the default argument. Um, I'm sorry. So can you give me a more specific example? So how would we change this to look like what you're asking uh, about? So yeah, if, if the class dog was a uh, name, self, uh, yeah, yeah, self name, color would be, uh, I guess, color would be defaulted to brown. Uh, but really, in fact, uh, I think you could just go down to line forty nine. I think when you have spot, yeah. So spot has a name, he has a color, and then he has true, and it just skipped over to the daily meals. Is that how's that? How do you do something like that? Um, so you're asking why spot specifically? Yeah, he doesn't have all four, uh, he doesn't have all four attributes, but it's still new to skip over one attribute in between. Mm -hmm. So how did it know to do that? Um, so the short answer is I have literally no idea. Like this honestly surprises me. Um, this is what I was saying before. I think Python is being a little bit smarter than I am. I would kind of expect Python to get confused and not, not know what this true is for, or assume that it's daily meals equals true, which you know is definitely not what I was expecting or not what I want. So you know, like coming from JavaScript world, I would expect this code to fail. But what I'm thinking is happening under the hood is that Python sees that I've passed in a Boolean value here. And for this keyword argument, the default value is a number. So it's gonna kind of assume that this is not supposed to go to this. But this other keyword uh, parameter does use a Boolean as its default value. So Python might infer that this true value, even though I didn't specify the keyword name, this true probably goes to is service animal because this is supposed to take Booleans as a default. Now, I'm not 100% sure that that's what's going on under the hood, but that uh, that's my best guess. So then do you always need the same amount as attributes as the class itself? So like if, da if daily meals was just, was just breed instead, would, it, would you still be able to skip over that somehow? Like, so daily meals was breed and its service animal is just like sound and you know the sound. So you, you have the sound. In fact, could, could I just share my screen instead? Yeah, let's do that. All right. So here. Um, I have the name, breed, sound, and color, but I basically, I, I, I don't know what the color, I don't know what the sound is, but the sound has a default, but it just never runs it. It's always going to pop an error. 
So I, I don't know how to skip over it. I mean, if I put in none, like it's suggested, it'll just it'll just say his sound is none. Well, try empty quotations. Well, I then think it'll, yeah, it'll just skip over that as well. It'll just be empty. Take out the comma. Then 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 his sound will be his sound will be brown and his color will default to white. So I know it's how do you how do you get the in between attribute is what I'm asking. So in this case, you would want to specify the keyword. So say color equals brown instead of just passing it in as the third one. So that'll help Python disambiguate what it's referring to. Oh yeah, okay, well done. Hey, thanks, that's what I was asking. Cool, yeah. Um, but also, so you said if you don't know what the sound is, like why don't you want to set that to none? Oh, no, no, I, I mean, I was, uh, well, I guess you could do that, but in this case, I was really just referring to is it possible to skip over an attribute? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's yeah, how you would do it. Good. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's honestly one of the things I don't especially like about Python is just how many different ways there are to write the parameters for your function. I just, I like the, that part of my code to be as simple as possible, just what is going into my function and what do I call these things? Um, so, it frustrates me a little bit when it's like a really complex function. It's hard to just figure out like, what do I pass in here? How do I call this? So I usually just have like a short list of positional arguments. Um, maybe the last one is a dictionary. So you can put in like a whole bunch of extra options specified as a dictionary, but it still makes the function signature look pretty simple. All right, uh, do we have any more questions for the moment? All right, let's continue. And, oh, Raphael, I wanted to throw in with all the keyword argument stuff that we were seeing that my guess is, you know, in, in like a work environment, you would probably just use the keyword argument on line 49 for the Boolean value for is service animal to avoid having to depend on Python being clever with its constructor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so even though, you know, this is valid Python and this totally works, this was surprising to me. This defies my expectations. And I would think another programmer who is not like spending 100% of their time in Python, someone who maybe has to write in multiple languages, like we will be, um, they might also be surprised by this behavior. So when possible, it's nice to write your code in a way that is like accessible to polyglot programmers, to people who work in other languages. Um, like I've mentioned before, that there are lots of uh, nifty little shorthand tricks in JavaScript, especially when it comes to like variable coercion. But people who are not like full-time JavaScript developers will often find those behaviors surprising. So as much as possible, you should write your code in a way so that it doesn't rely on kind of automatic or unintuitive behaviors. Um, so in this case, if the dog is defined with keyword arguments, I would use the keywords as I'm invoking the function. So I would say is service animal equals true just to be explicit about this instead of relying on uh, everyone understanding the implicit behavior. Um, I know you, know you might think it's just extra typing and it doesn't really change how your program functions, but generally speaking, um, you know, code is written once and then read many, many times. So that's what you should optimize for. If you have to do a little bit of extra typing and it makes your code easier to read, that's absolutely worth it. All right, so for the next example, we're gonna talk about some more complicated inheritance scenarios. So I'm gonna make a new file actually. Uh, 
hopefully this file name gives you some clues about what we're about to do here. So I'm gonna make a couple more classes here. So we got our person, they have names and jobs, just like most people. All right, so we've got our basic person class. It's you know functional, it works, we can make people. So our basic person class created a person object. She's working hard as an influencer. You know, it's a very demanding line of work, I'm sure. So let's make another class which might relate to the first class. So uh, one thing that you know, differentiates some computers from others is how many cores they have. Uh, you know, an old computer might just have a single core. Newer computers might have you know, two, four, eight cores. I don't know, I'm not really a hardware expert. Math module in here, real quick. This computers always do math. So our computer, when it computes, it's going to calculate pi, but to uh, as many decimal places as it has cores. So, you know, the more cores you have, the more processing power, and the uh, more precisely you can calculate pi. So let's create a couple of computer objects here. Because, uh, you know, everything these days actually has a tiny computer in it, probably running Linux. So our toaster is going to be a one core computer. Let's also make copy three to six. This is a four core computer, a little more modern. Let's watch them go. So the toaster computes, he can only figure out that pi is 3.1. Uh, copy 386 tries to compute pi, and he's able to get a little further, it tells me it's 3.1416, great. So we've got two classes, seemingly unrelated. Now let's, let's have a little thought experiment real quick. Let's think about uh, is a relationships. What is a type of thing that both is a person and is a computer. A Borg. I hear a cyborg. Oh, I said the Borg, but that works too. 
I was going okay. Trekkie. Ah, uh, yeah. A job, an employee. <laughs> okay, so we've got the Borg. Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, so we've got a Borg. He's not human. An artificial. Uh, He's a lizard person. Mark, That's what I heard. Mark Zuckerberg. We should name it that. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I don't know. So, like we saw before, we put the class that we inherit from in parentheses. But if I'm telling you this guy inherits from both person and computer, just separate our list with commas. Right, so now for the cyborg class, because this has to do everything a person can do, it needs to have a name and a job. And it also needs to have everything the computer has, number of cores, because it also inherits from computer. So I'm gonna have to define a new init method just for my Mark Zuckerberg that has um, all of these parameters passed in. So name, job, and number of cores. So just like before, I'm going to uh, reuse the constructors from my other classes. Now, previously, I just used the super keyword, which gets me the parent class. Now, in this case, there are two parent classes. So it's kind of ambiguous which one is uh, going to be returned if I call super. Now there is a way to know this. So there's this thing called uh, MRO is the method resolution order. The idea is that if you're inheriting from multiple classes, there is actually a specific order that like it checks them. So if I just um, ask for super, when I have multiple classes inheriting from each other. This is the process that Python follows in order to figure out um, you know, which class it actually is going to use. I honestly have never memorized how this works and prefer to just use simpler forms of inheritance in my code or just not use inheritance at all. So this has just not been a problem that's come up for me. But in case this is a problem that comes up for you, you should know that the solution is something called MRO or uh, method resolution order in Python. Uh, I guess there's a function for it, MRO also. Huh. So I guess it like actually tells you the list of classes that it'll like check in order as it's like going up the parent, parent, parent chain. Uh, so that's interesting. Hopefully you won't have to dig too deep into this because uh, what I'm going to do here, actually, I'm going to take a little shortcut, do something that's more explicit. So instead of using super and, you know, depending on the reader to know which class that returns, I'm just going to explicitly call out the class that I want to use. So we'll just access the person class itself. Uh, and I didn't get an instance of the person class, just the person class itself, but I can still access the init method. And then in this case, I have to um, pass in self explicitly. So, how do I do that here actually? Yeah, so it's a little bit different. Um, 
Then in the single inheritance, I did not pass in self here because I was using an instance. Here I'm calling this method off the class itself, not an instance. So I am passing in self. It's going to look a little bit different. Uh, please don't think too hard about it. And also name and job. So these are the other um, arguments that the person constructor needs. So you know, person takes self name job, passing in self name job. And then similarly, I'm going to run self through the computer constructor. Which needs self and number of cores. Dalton, do you have a question? And the reason you're not getting um, an instance is because you're not using super correct. Right. Okay. So it's maybe a little bit unintuitive, but super does not return the super class. It returns an instance of the super class. Cool. Yep. Cool. So here I've made my custom init method that just uh, repeats the work of the person init method and the computer init method. Uh, let's answer some questions. Yeah, so I did a quick question. So where you did person.init, if you did super and then put person in the parentheses, does that do the same thing or no? Um, you're saying like this? Yeah, I was just curious, like to specify which super class you were referring to. Uh, this does something. I'm not exactly sure if it does what we want it to. Let's, let's investigate that. No, oh, you can do it afterwards. I was just curious. Okay. Uh, Alicia? Yeah, I wanted to ask, um, why wouldn't, or could we just make it standard practice that instead of saying like parent instance or the super init, um, it seems like going back to your point earlier of make your code intuitive, that they would look at that and say, oh, duh, person is the, is the parent here that I'm inheriting. Whereas even if we weren't trying to inherit from two, specifically saying this is the parent I'm calling from seems like it would be more intuitive than either parent instance or just super. It depends on what you want to communicate with your code. So so in this case I'm explicitly um, you know you calling out person and computer in case you're not exactly sure what the super method would return and you don't, and I want to make it more obvious specifically which classes um, are being used uh, for these init methods. What is less obvious though is how these classes relate to Mark Zuckerberg. Um, now, of course, you can just see here person computer and then just see, oh, these are the same classes down here. But like in general, it makes it like there's one extra step you have to do to figure out what the relationship is between these two classes in this init method and the Mark Zuckerberg class. Whereas if I use the super class or if I use the super method, it makes it a little bit more clear what the relationship is between that class in the init method and the class that I'm defining here. But it makes it less obvious what the actual class is. So imagine, you know, instead of two classes with one parent and one subclass, maybe I have a chain of like 11 classes, just children of children of children of children, just a straight line of inheritance down. So in that case, it would be probably less meaningful to explicitly name the class because like it's not as obvious like which class is the parent of which class. But if you just see the super function being used, then it's a little more clear like, oh, that's just the immediate parent is the init method we're using. So 
do you want to communicate more what is the relationship between this class and this class in which case maybe super communicates that most clearly or do you want to make it more clear what is the actual specific class whose constructor is being used and I'm focused less on the relationship between this class and this class. Yeah, that makes it very clear. Thanks. Cool. You're welcome. Did we have other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Um, so if you change the order of under uh, the init, so if you put computer above person, would you have to change the order of the parameters? I'm sorry, can you say that again? So if you, so if you flip line 35 and 34, would you have on line 32, would you have to reorder the parameters? Or does it matter? I don't think that matters. Okay. Uh, do we have other questions? Questions, questions. No? Okay, so let's continue. Um, okay. So let's let's actually instantiate our class here. Got suck equals suckerborg. Uh, he is a hacker and he has eight cords. He's a very advanced computer. Let's see, let's watch him work. Um, oh, right. So I just, I did not override the work method. So that's just using the person work. But that's that's really inefficient. You know, if you've got a computer in your brain, you should be able to work a little bit faster than a regular person. So I'm going to define a work method for our Mark Zuckerberg class. So he's got eight cores. So he is working hard as a hacker, like eight times faster than a regular person could. So here, kind of another way that we're able to uh, use the original person method, but then modify it in a way that's specific uh, for our Mark Zuckerberg class. Um, so let's see, we had a question before if we could use this other syntax. So let me see, let's see what happens. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not really sure. I know that this is syntax I've seen in Python. I forget some of the specifics of it. I don't think it does exactly what we want to, or it's more complex than we might like it to be. So not a wild question, but I don't have a great answer for you off the top of my head. And I'm not exactly sure why this is upsetting me. Uh, saying argument one must be type, not string. This is definitely not a string, so I'm not exactly sure what the issue is. Might have to come back to that one, sorry. Can you scroll up to the person class?
Okay, thanks. Uh, what other questions have we got? Uh, if I may, uh, if you had your person and your computer in separate files, how would that, how would the import work? Do you import the parent into those individual subclasses? Yeah, since the uh, Mark Zuckerberg references them specifically, I would need to import them. So, so what would that look like? So we make like person.py. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have computer.py. So I know that this import syntax is wrong. Uh, I always get tripped up um, on the import syntax between JavaScript and Python because they're very similar, but not quite. From person import, yeah. So in this case, Computer and person are both parents to Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, so, okay, yeah, the computer class needs the math module in order to work. Because uh, we're referencing it here and it's not actually imported in the computer file, it's only in the multiple inheritance file. So I had to import it here. Uh, that also means that math is no longer needed in this main file, so I can remove it from there. Cool. So now I have um, re implemented the original behavior in a slightly more organized way. I got person, in, person and computer are in separate files. Um, now, this might be actually a little bit confusing because the class has the same name as the file. You know, I defined a person class in person.py, uh, computer class in computer.py. So practically speaking, this is actually a sensible thing to do. Just have the file's name for the class that they contain. It's a very common uh, pattern, I'd say. But it might make this a little bit more confusing to read because it just says, you know, from computer, import computer. You don't know which one of these is the file name and which one's the module name. So um, I'm going to rename these files just for educational purposes. Uh, what are we doing? Oh. My editor is so helpful. Um, it knows that I was importing this file into another and I renamed the file. So it automatically updated uh, my import statement here to use the new file name. So that's convenient, I guess. Uh, and then we're with person.py. We're going to rename this to person class file.py. Yeah, let's rename it. Cool, great. So here from person class file, we import the person class. From the computer class file, we import the computer class. And again, nothing's broken, still works, same as ever. So in this case, you have um, multiple inheritance as your child, and then the computer and the person are the parents and they're in separate files. And you're importing both parents into your subclass. Mm -hmm. If you had two subclasses and one parent, each of the subclass files would import the parent into both of those? Yep. 
if you wanted to if you wanted to uh, initiate both subclasses right so if i wanted to initiate uh, initiate a, a computer and a, a person under mark zuckerberg it wouldn't really let me do that outside of the parent because they're separate files you can't run two files at once simultaneously um, well so we are importing the person and computer classes into this file so yeah. like right here i'm yeah just making persons and computers yeah but in the scenario where you have one parent and two children, would you run from the parent file? No, because your children are importing the parent. So where would you, you would initiate each of the children in their separate files, right? You're talking about where I'm like actually yeah. instantiating? Yeah. Correct. Instances. Um, so yeah, that wouldn't be in any of the files that actually define the classes. So, huh. you know, if we want to take this a step further, even this Mark Zuckerberg class would be in yet a third file. And then I would actually have like a main.py file where I'm uh, actually uh, instantiating everything. Instances. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. That answers my question. And that's just the difference between the class and the products that it creates, right? You don't have to like, the class would be in a file, but the products can be in this one just all together. Right. Yeah, that's definitely the most fundamental distinction in object-oriented programming um, between the class itself, which is your factory, your, bl your blueprint, and uh, the instances, which are you know, the individual examples of that class that are created from the factory. All right, what's going on in the chat? Nothing, nothing too super interesting. Do we have any more questions about OOP inheritance? Um, this is all the content I've got for you for today. So the rest of today's lecture is really just open for questions. So I understand the convention is usually that you, you put a single class into each file to have like its own, uh, these tests on them get really, really big. What if you have two classes in the in the file? How would you import both classes? Do you just have to put a comma after, like on the top where you, when you're importing and then specify both uh, both classes you want? Um, so that's a good question. So let's say person class file. Yeah, so what if like person and computer were both in the same file? We just put person, like import just one file and then put comma in both classes. Um, okay, so the person class file has two classes. Yeah, that's legit. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, as another... as both, I'm sorry. As long as both those files are in the same directory, you don't have to add anything else for or for uh, for importing it. Right. It gets a little bit more complicated when the files are in a subfolder or in a parent folder. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I would have to like have some kind of a file path here, like. Oh, hang on. It'd be like. Something like that, kind of. Uh, actually, I'm really curious. So we're going to try this now. So we've got some folder with another class.py has another class inside of it. 
in order to import that here. Um, some folder dot another class or another class. Um, oh, but now we have two classes called another class. So that's not going to work. So from some folder dot another class, import yet another class. And we have also successfully imported that into our file here. So yeah, I think this syntax is kind of weird because if it's in a fold subfolder, I would think you would use a slash character to indicate folder hierarchies. For some reason in Python, they want to think of it as like sub modules. So like this folder like is a Python module and then another class is like a module inside of it. So that's why we're using this dot notation. I think it's a little weird, but that's just how it works in Python. Um, so I know I've showed you this article before, but really like I return to this article all the time. I think it's pretty useful. Um, just a side-by-side -side comparison of how you import things in Python versus in JavaScript. Um, in particular, pointing out that there are some ways of importing things that only work in one language or the other, so there might not even be an equivalent. You know, you can see here something you can do in JavaScript doesn't exist in Python. Um, styles of importing in Python just don't exist in JavaScript, but for the most part, there are equivalents. Um, so yeah, they're very similar and just different enough that I get tripped up on it as I'm switching back and forth. So I find this to be a very useful article. All right, do we have any more comments, thoughts, questions? I, I do. Let's hear it. Um, so I tried out the separate files for the parent and the children. Uh, and I noticed that if you have a parent and two children, both the children are importing the parent, which means that in the children, you can reference the parent function for the parent class. Mm -hmm. But in the parent, you can't reference the children. Why would you need because, to? Well, I'm curious, like if I had a, a, a method that both the children used, but I wanted to have like a, if this child versus if this other child in that method, I guess that would be a situation where that method no longer belongs in the parent. Even if they do the same thing, but they do it uh, uh, with some limitation on it. Um, I guess I guess you just rewrite it at that point. If it's like 95% the same thing, but they each do that 5% differently. So I'd say generally speaking, parent classes shouldn't need to be aware of their child classes. Okay. Like the children are going to be aware of their parents, going to import them and inherit from them or whatever. But nowhere in the definition of a parent class should it need to refer to its children. Okay. Um, I mean, also because you're going to define it first, so it can't refer to its children. Sure. All right. Um, any more questions? Questions? I feel like questions are kind of drying up. So there is actually one last thing that I want to show you, kind of some closing thoughts. Um, so like I said before, you know, the purpose of inheritance, the reason why we use this is to write less code. In theory, inheritance is supposed to make our lives easier. But um, a lot of people, you know, they learn inheritance and they think it's just the best or the only way to write code and they try to apply it to all kinds of situations and they often run into trouble. So, you know, I mentioned earlier situations of like dogs 
and tables, both inheriting from a four-legged class. That's kind of one example where things are going to make less sense in the future. But um, another thing to consider is that like, even if you think it's sensible to have some inheritance relationship in your code, like requirements change randomly, just like your boss comes in some Monday morning and says, you know, we got to pivot. We're doing this other thing instead. And it's important to remember that, um, you know, the programs you build are not like set in stone right after you build them. It's not like you get a list of requirements, you do that list of requirements and then you're done, you move on. But most like software projects are kind of living ongoing efforts and you need to be able to update them constantly uh, week after week as you know you find bugs or requirements change, users request new features, whatever. So um, people have kind of found over time that uh, using like a very complex inheritance structure in your code makes it hard to change, it makes it hard to maintain. You're really like crystallizing a lot of very specific relationships. And if it turns out that something changes in like a conceptually small way, it might actually be very big on a technical level in terms of rearranging your classes. So I wanna show you uh, this other article real quick. I think this is kind of hilarious. It's not an especially useful article to read you know, top to bottom, so I haven't assigned it to you. This is kind of this one guy's journey of being a crappy coder where he has all these global variables to learning object-oriented programming and yada, yada. But there's, nice, there's this nice little anecdote in the middle that I think is really funny. Um, talking about Doom 3, a uh, popular shooting game made by id Software many years ago, which is apparently open source and uses object-oriented inheritance to describe all the different types of things. So, you know, everything in their system inherit from id class and then id entity. Anything that can move is an animated entity. But below that, they've got weapons. Um, forget what an AF entity was. That was a specific type of like movable thing. Um, so, yeah, we've got vehicles with different types of vehicles underneath them. Um, we have giveable entities, which uh, for those you don't know, means it is capable of being exploded into you know, gross fleshy bits. And then specifically, we have two types of giveable entities, some that have their heads already attached, and then um, actors, which would be like a human, kind of more that runs around. And then we've got two subtypes of those, players and AI. So this, you know, all in one image kind of summarizes how all these different things in their game relate to each other. And it looks sensible, but this guy kind of poses some interesting, um, you know, thought experiments here about ways, simple requests that you could receive that would make your life very hard. So for example, the boss comes in and says, hey, change of plans, the player is now a car. So just look at, this inheritance structure, car, you know, four wheel vehicles is inheriting from vehicle from entity base, player is inheriting from actor, giveable entity base. So in order to make this small change, like, hey, the player is now a car, we have to rearrange a lot of our existing code. It's not as simple as just saying like, okay, like all the controller bindings are gonna move the car forward instead of this player forward. Like a whole bunch of stuff needs to get rearranged. Um, and you know, the other example they pose here is like, okay, what if we want to put turrets on the car? Well, again, weapons are all the way up here and they're totally disconnected from turrets or from the cars. So accommodating that change would again require moving a lot of code around, even though we've already defined turrets, we've or we've already defined cars and we've already defined weapons. So uh, for this reason, actually, uh, in modern kind of software culture, inheritance is much less popular than it used to be, I would say. Um, there's kind of been pushback in recent years against 
OOP inheritance, it's used more sparingly. So like these game dev frameworks still use inheritance, but it's at like a more low level. Kind of a lot of the built-in classes will use inheritance internally to avoid duplicating code in the engine itself. But for the code that the users write for their actual like specific game logic, it typically doesn't use inheritance, at least not nearly as much. There's another style that is favored uh, called composition, which, yeah. So this is what they talk about. And again, I'm not going to make you read it, but the idea is that uh, you can just like add a property to an object for all of the different things that it can do. And it doesn't need to like be a subtype of some other subtype of thing. So this generally is like a more flexible and kind of intuitive way of composing complex functionality. And uh, if anyone has ever used like Unity before, the, um, the game development engine, it uses this system composition for like most of the functionality. They call it the entity component system, but like any object in the game is basically just like a dictionary essentially that you can just add a whole bunch of other properties to it, which are like the actual functionality, like having physics or being able to be controlled by a player or you know, graphically rendering on the screen with specific colors or something. Um, and they wouldn't, you know, just inherit from objects that have those features. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's my story. I just really like the whole player is now a car line. I just think it's a funny challenge. Um, but for sure, as a software engineer, you're going to be given wacky requests that will you know, make you rethink your entire code base, especially often like from non-technical product managers, they might ask you like, oh, can't you just do this one thing? It's so easy. And they have no idea how your code is set up under the hood. So you should hope that it's at least constructed in a way that it's easy to make changes going forward and not that you're strongly assuming that the like, requirements are never going to change in the future because requirements do change all the time. Um, it just doesn't seem like it when you're in the boot camp because we give you assignments, tell you exactly what you need to do, and then you do it and you're done. But it's not exactly how things work uh, once you're actually working in a dev shop. Um, so Evan's asking a great question about open source. Uh, it doesn't have as much to do with inheritance. So I'm going to conclude our lecture for now and then answer some more questions over the next few minutes. So thank everybody. Thanks everybody for showing up, being engaged, asking questions. I loved it. A lot of great stuff today. I'll see you this afternoon.